Okay, guys, it's the 19th or 18th, I'm sorry, November 18, 2020, and we are now uh, just doing a review section or session for aerosol humidity therapy and CPT. Uh, covered a lot of information in the last couple of days on humidity and aerosol and how they're very, very important to our uh, well-being. Um, All right, so the first thing we talked about was how humidity is, uh, first of all, you can't see humidity, but aerosol you can see, all right? And humidity is water in a gaseous state. Water in a gaseous state or water vapor, can't see that, okay? Molecular water in a gas. Aerosol is particulate water in a gas, right? You can see the particles, uh, but you can't see molecules, right? So molecule of uh, molecular water in a gas, water vapor, uh, water in a gaseous state is humidity. And then we had a couple of terms. Uh, potential humidity is uh, the potential or uh, how much water vapor that a gas can possibly hold at a given temperature. Okay, as that temperature changes, the potential changes. Right, as the, the temperature goes up the potential humidity goes up, but the absolute doesn't necessarily go up. That's why the relative humidity goes down, okay? But when the temperature goes down, the potential goes down, absolute goes down, but the relative humidity will stay the same due to the uh, mathematical formula for relative humidity. Now, Saturated. Saturated is when the apps, I mean, the relative humidity is 100%. We say it's completely saturated. If a gas has the ability or the potential to hold 44 milligrams of water at 37 degrees Celsius, if it has that potential and you check it and it is holding the whole 44, then that means it's completely saturated. Okay. That means that the relative humidity is 100%. Okay. Absolute humidity is the amount of water in a gas at that time. The amount of water vapor in a gas at that moment is the absolute humidity, okay? Um, relative humidity, of course, is when we uh, do the division, absolute over potential times 100, okay? All right, the humidity of alveolar gas. Alveolar gas at 37 degrees Celsius, which is body temperature, alveolar gas holds 44 milligrams of water of humidity, right? At 37 degrees Celsius and a 100% relative humidity, the pressure that's exerted by that water vapor is 47 millimeters of mercury. That is the water pressure that you have uh, um, indicated in the alveolar air equation. You have to take the barometric pressure and take away the water pressure because the pre we're talking about pressures. If we want to know what the pressure of oxygen is in the lungs, then in the alveoli, when I check that alveoli, it's going to have a lot of different pressures in there. I just want to know oxygen. It's got carbon dioxide pressure in there. It's got uh, the nitrogen pressure and stuff that's in there. It has uh, water vapor pressure that's in there. It has oxygen pressure, but I just want no oxygen. So I have to subtract away the rest of it. I got to take the CO2 out. I have to take the, um, I have to take the um, water vapor out in order to know what's left, which is the oxygen, okay? Um, <clears throat> you don't take out the the nitrogen because that's mostly what it is, okay? So you can't take that away, otherwise you won't have an open alveoli at all, okay? So alveolar gas is 100% relative humidity or completely saturated, okay? Now, when we inhale gas that is from outside that does not have the same humidity that we have in the alveoli, there's a difference there. The difference between outside humidity and inside humidity in our bodies 
is humidity deficit. Our bodies have to make up that deficit when we inhale, okay? The Egan's book has a good picture of a diagram of humidity deficit, showing you the outside or ambient uh, humidity and the alveolar humidity. And when you breathe in that, just say for instance, uh, the ambient humidity is like 20 milligrams of water, right? But inside the alveoli, it has to be 44. Well, the nose and the oral and nasal pharyngeal space have to make up that deficit before it gets to the lungs, okay? The lungs don't want it at 20. It wants it only at 44, right? And so that means the lungs, the nose has to work hard to get that outside air that's inspired wet and warm to 44. So that's a deficit. The difference between the two is the humidity deficit, right? Humidity is normally supplied to inspire gas by what? The nasal and oral pharynx passages. Humidity adds moisture to the respiratory tract. Okay, if the nose and the uh, oral pharyngeal space is not doing its job for whatever reason, then the gas has to take moisture from the what? The mucus blanket. The mucus blanket, yeah, the mucus blanket, the trachea, those larger airways, it's gonna start taking moisture away from that because the lungs don't care where you get the money from. I just need my money, right? I don't care where you get it from. Just don't arrive at my door without it, okay? And so if the nose doesn't have it, don't have humidity to give for whatever reason, it's not working, there's a disease process, a cold or whatever you got, um, then it's going to get it from the mucus blanket. And so when it does start to get it from the mucus blanket, that's going to start drying out the mucus blanket, right? The mucus on the larger airway starts to get dry, thick, right? They start to, that's one of the reasons why the soul layer is affected. Remember, I mean, the uh, cilia function is affected. Remember we said which one of these uh, can cause a decrease in cilia function? We said dehydration, a decrease in the soul layer, cigarette smoking, right? Um, and dehydration, those, those four things will keep it from functioning. The cilia can't beat. And so if the nose is not doing its job or if the patient has a trach or ET tube and you as the respiratory therapist are not providing that humidity that they're supposed to have because when the airway is bypassed, if the nose and the and the uh, pharyngeal space are bypassed, now it's pure cold uh, anhydrous gas, okay? Dry gas going straight into the airway. And so then we have to make sure we provide humidity, okay? And so we use different humidifiers and nebulizers to help accomplish that 44 milligrams and 37 degrees, okay? We're trying to mimic the nose if the nose can't do its job, all right? And there's also a humidifier that we use that we call the artificial nose. What is that one called? Mm -hmm. Humidifier, we said is the artificial nose. Is it the barrier? No. Is it the ultrasonic? No. Artificial nose. Is it the heat and moisture exchangers? Yeah, heat and moisture exchanger, the HME. The HME, this right here. The HME is the artificial nose. When you breathe into it, it traps your heat and your moisture. And when you breathe in, it gives you heat and moisture right back. That's what your nose do. Give heat and moisture to the airway tract every time you take a breath. No matter how dry it is outside, the nose is going to heat it and humidify it up to 100% relative humidity and give it to the body. That's why you have to be drinking enough what? Water. That's why water is important for you to have in your diet. A lot of people, I don't like water. I can't drink water. And so they have issues. Uh, they may seem healthy, but they have some issues with hydration if they're not drinking enough water. It can cause problems with your humidity cause problem with your cilia beating, right? Which can it ultimately cause more colds, more bronchitis, more issues over the year because there's not their cilia is not moving like yours because they don't drink enough water, okay? 
also uh, they can have impaired heart function because their electrolytes are not firing right because there's not enough water okay so humidity is very very important right now the next aspect of this is aerosol now aerosol are water particles particulate water in a gas humidity is molecular water you can't see molecules but you can see particles okay so aerosol are water particles that are floating in the air, also known as mist, also known as a fog. All of those things simply seem to just float on air, like a cloud. Okay, a cloud is a big aerosol pouch just floating in the sky, okay? You can see it. Now, there are some things that cause that stability to be uh, not stable, right? Aerosol. It's suspended in the air, but there's some things that can affect it and it can no longer be suspended in the air, right? Some things like gravity, uh, as it gets colder, the water particles get bigger, they start to come together and they get big and heavy. And as they were able to float, now they're so heavy, they fall out of the sky like rain, okay? That's called rain out, okay? Uh, and some other issues as well. But aerosol or water particles suspended in the air, particulate water in a gas, a mist, or fog. Here go the factors that affect stability. Well, the factors that affect the st stability, we said some of them are gravity, particle size, right? Um, inertial impaction, right? Remember all of those factors that affect stability of that aerosol, okay? Because if we want the aerosol to float. We don't want it to flow outside. We want the aerosol to float down to the parenchyma, right? That's where we want the aerosol to make it to. And so what can cause my aerosol particles from my breathing treatment not to make it to my alveola? So Gravity is one of them. What about how I um, breathe it in? What if I suck the breathing treatment in really, really hard and fast? Is it going to make it to my alveoli? No. It's going to be impacted into the back of my throat, right? So that's one of the inertial impaction. Also, uh, when the airways turn corners, right? The, our airway, tracheobronchial tree, is not just one long tube. It changes direction. The, the, oh, the, um, the um, airways get smaller and smaller and smaller as you go further and further down the generations. And so as they get smaller, they run into the sides, right? The particles can hit the sides and they are deposited right there. So it's very important, two most important things that uh, help the aerosol get farther and deep and deposited to the airway is the ventilatory pattern and particle size okay the two most important components of penetration and deposition would be the breathing pattern and the size of the what particles 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 and what is that size of the particles that we say are best one, one to three. three one to three microns make sure you know microns gonna say milliliters or millimeters of mercury or whatever don't have the wrong unit of measure but one to three microns is the best size for deep deposition of aerosol particles and the way you breathe. Because I don't care if it's perfect, two microns. So one to three is good, right? But two would be absolutely perfect, right? But I don't care if every last one of the particles are two microns. If you don't breathe right, it's not going to make it there. If you breathe real shallow, real shallow, it ain't going to never make it there, okay? If you breathe real hard and fast, it's not going to make it there. has to be a good respiratory pattern. Slow deep with an inspiratory hold. Slow and deep with an inspiratory hold. So when they're taking a breathing treatment, Mr. Johnson, I want you to breathe normal, right? Just breathe normal, but every now and then, take a slow, deep breath and inspiratory hold for about three to five seconds and let it out. And then continue to breathe normal. Because they can't do that every breath. They'll get lightheaded, okay? Just breathe normal with the breathing treatment. Every four or five breaths or so, take a slow, deep breath in, hold it, and let it go. 
okay? And that helps them get best penetration and deposition of the aerosol particles, okay? This is just a little chart here that kind of gives you a, you know, it's pretty accurate. Um, um, size of the particle, right? The percent of it that is deposited and where is it deposited, okay? So if I have particle sizes that are 100 uh, microns, if there are 100 microns, 100% 100 of those particles are gonna hit the nose, the mouth, or the equipment, okay? Never gonna make it to the lower airway, okay? If they are 40 to 100 microns, 100% 100 of those will be deposited in the upper airways, okay? That's like the trachea, the main left main stem bronchus, right? Well, no, no, I'm sorry. Upper airways will be mouth, nose, and throat, right? That's the upper airway, I'm sorry. And then 40 to 15 to 40, about 40% 40 to 100% will hit those upper airways. Some of it may go far, farther, right? Some of it may get there, but most of it still in the upper airways. Eight to 15 microns will be in 30 to 40% of that will hit the bronchi. We'll get down to the bronchi, right? So trachea, left and main stem bronchus, then bronchi. That's where that medicine will get deposited. Still not helping us. Okay, still not helping us. Two to five. Now, two to five. Fifty percent of those will be in the bronchioles. In the bronchioles. So that's where we want to get respiratory bronchioles, right? Fifty-five percent. But then it says one to two microns, less than fifty percent, and I mean, uh, less than I don't know why they say less than fifty in the alveoli. Then less than one. That should be, that should be a hundred percent right here. Okay. Oh, my bad. Two, one to two microns will be pretty much in the alveoli, okay? And then less than one micron does what? Gets back out, comes back out, okay? So I'm a, I have to fix, I don't know what I put, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Less than 50? No, it's not less than 50. All right, more than 50% will be in the alveoli. And uh, one micron, all of it will be exhaled, right? 10% of the same will be back exhaled out. So that's why I say it's pretty accurate. I, I don't know about these two right here. Uh, one to two microns will be in the alveoli, okay? Because well, one to three is perfect therapeutic range. All right, what are the indications? Uh, well, aerosol is for airway clearance. We help clear the airway uh, with the aerosol. If I'm having, you know, I'm, I'm getting my regular little humidity or whether the room is fine, I got good humidity, but I have a lot of secretions. My secretions are thick and they can't come up. Well, humidity is not enough. I might need to now put a little bit of particulate water on it to really wet it up, okay? And particulate water is aerosol, okay? I gotta hit it with an aerosol. And so I'm gonna use that for airway clearance, right? Help clear some of that junk out of my airway. If it's thick and it can't come up, put a little bit of aerosol on it and we'll see if that works. That's the first step to airway clearance is bland aerosols, okay? That's like, Regular distilled water, because our aerosol bottles are just distilled water. That's all it is. Okay, that's a bland, it's called bland aerosol. Uh, sometimes we can use normal saline. If that's not enough, we put a little saline. You know that stuff you squirt up in your baby's nose if the nose gets thick. Uh, if you ever tasted it, it's kind of salty. Okay, that's normal saline. Okay, this uh, aerosol that we use in aerosol, it's not salty, it's just distilled water. Okay, but if you use, um, the step up would be normal saline, hypertonic saline, what is really salty, all right? When we get to pharmacology, you guys are gonna know what those are, but those are in the class of mucolytics, okay? When we go from aerosol, bland aerosol, and they don't work, we step up to mucolytics, which are medicines for mucus, right? We got some mucus, uh, medicine that will actually go and break down just the mucus. It has special jobs to break down mucus, which is coming up in, in um, next, which is pharmacology, okay? So um, so after bland aerosol uses, that don't work, we jump up to like hypertonic saline, which we use hypertonic saline, just like the ultrasonic nebulizer to induce sputum. Hypertonic saline will make that stuff melt, okay? It's really, really salty, way more salty than uh, we call it osmorality has way more osmorality than the, than the lung, right? So it's more salty than the, the, like sweat. 
Normal saline is like your sweat. If you ever tasted your sweat or your tears, it's kind of salty. That's normal saline. That's your body's osmorality. Okay. Some people are more salty than others. What my drums? Okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so after the bland aerosol doesn't work, we go to mucolytics. We can go to prescription drugs. If we go into CPT, we go into drainage, we go into all of that. See? So we start low. Let's get a little bit of aerosol. That don't work. Now it's time to pull out some bigger guns. Okay. So the indications for aerosol, of course, we said to uh, moisten the dried airways, uh, just like mostly the same as humidity. But the main thing about aerosol, we can deliver what? Medication. The difference between indications for humidity and aerosol, the main difference is that aerosol can deliver medication. Okay. They both will wet up the airways. They both will add humidity to the dried airways. But aerosol will have the, uh, has the ability to carry medicine with it, okay? Humidity cannot. Of course, there are some hazards of aerosol there because once we decide to go with aerosol, we are now introducing a lot of volume of water into a patient system, okay? And so now we know we're about to add water to the system we need to be focusing on and being careful of what patient we're dealing with because certain patients are sensitive to water intake, like congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, anybody who has real bad diabetes where their kidneys are not working. We have to be careful of the amount of water we're adding to the system because they already can't pee it out, okay? They're having a problem urinating it out and getting rid of that water and so we're just adding a thousand milliliters per shift, right? Or maybe two shifts. In about two shifts, we'll get a thousand milliliters of water introduced into the system. So we have to be careful of the amount of water we add, okay? All right, this is just a quick picture of a Passover humidifier, which is a wick type. This one has these two wicks, right? Got the wicks in there. The wicks go down into the water, okay? And the water gets on the wick. The wick is like a paper towel type of material that you notice it's a pass over here. You got water, air goes in, comes down and sucks up the water from the wicks and comes back out. It just passes over or through the wicks, okay? So this is the wick type. When you have these little wicks, like you think about a candle wick, it's just sticking down in the water. Those paper towel-like wicks will suck up the water from the bottom and get moist, all right? As the gas flows in, it passes and takes the humidity from the wicks and gives it to the patient on this side, okay? Then you have the Passover membrane type. This is the membrane type. The membrane type, the gas flows in, dry gas, and look, you got a water supply thing here, and this will be water, right? And then on top of the water, there's a thin layer of paper towel. It's called a hydrophobic membrane, right? Hydrophobic membrane, okay? Uh, it will separate the gas from the water, all right? And when it does that, as the gas goes across here, it picks up the moisture that comes through the hydrophobic membrane and takes it to the patient. It's just passing through, okay? Not being uh, 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 shaken or anything like that. It's just passing through, All right? Now, if I have it on a heater, it then becomes a what? If I heat the water, now it's called Cascade. Cascade. Cascade, right? There's a heater right here, but that don't mean it's on. Right now, if it's just a Passover membrane type, it's just passing over. But if I heat it, it now turns into a cascade, all right? All right, the general considerations for your nebulizers, right? Um, when we're talking about those jet nebulizers, aerosol face tint, aerosol T-piece, aerosol tray, all of those are used from your nebulizers, which produce aerosol, okay? Nebulizers produce aerosols. Humidifiers produce what? Humidity. Humidity, okay? People who eat beans produce gas. <laughs> All right. Hi.
ha, 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 clever. <laughs> general considerations for nebulizers, 44 milligrams per liter is the target volume for 100% effective uh, large volume nebulizer. If my large volume nebulizer can produce 44 milligrams per liter, I'm good because that's what the body wants, right? So that's what we're looking for. That's the target volume, 44 milligrams per liter. That's how much water volume we want to be able to produce and deliver with each breath. The therapeutic range of the aerosol particles is one to three microns, okay? Don't forget that nebulizers are potential sources of infection, nosocomial infection. Electrical nebulizers are potential shocks. So if the patient is getting therapy in a pool, don't throw a, a nebulizer, heated nebulizer in the water with them. Oh, don't forget about your heat. Now you're getting your body wet, but don't forget your lungs, right? Don't do that. You shock everybody in the pool. All right, nebulizers add fluid to the body. They do add fluid to the body, all right? This nebulizer here is a thousand milliliters. So I'm not gonna say one eight hour shift, but a 12 hour shift, depending on the humidity of the room, right? Because if the room is real dry, it's gonna be producing a lot more. All right, it just does. The temperature of the room, all that matters. So you can see how one patient's bottle, they had the same flow. How come his bottle didn't complete, but I went to next door and his bottle did because his next door room was hot in the mug, right? He had his room temperature up really hot. It's hot in there. So now that the temperature is up, it's going to produce more humidity, more aerosol is going to be spitting out. It's going to be more collecting in your bag and everything because it's producing more, right? But the next door neighbor, he got his room on 40 or 50 degrees and it's just blowing out it's less humidity right so it's it, it lasts a little longer but either way go in two shifts one bottle will be gone okay two shifts so in a 12 hour shift let's say two shifts that's 24 hours in 24 hours you can have given a patient all of this water into his lungs okay so you have to be very careful on who you're giving uh, aerosol to because it adds water to the body all right, and that's why you need to monitor the patients carefully for fluid overload. All right, postural drainage. Postural drainage is the next uh, aspect of this unit. Uh, once the bland aerosol and the humidity is not working and the patient is still suffering from uh, consolidation, right? A consolidation in one of his or her segments. When one of their segments become consolidated, I mean, it's full of mucus. Uh, we have to start thinking of other ways to get rid of it, right? Pulmonary hygiene, how can I get rid of it, all right? Uh, <clears throat> so the indications would be to mobilize those accumulated secretions, right? Those accumulated or consolidated secretions due to somebody who may have COPD, who doesn't have a good expiratory flow, so they can't really get it out. If you can't exhale well, then that means you can't cough good, right? If you can't get the air out, then you don't have a good cough. You don't have a strong ability to cough. Your vital capacity is lower, okay? Because ooh, my force bottle, force, well, my force vital capacity is low, right? When we do a maneuver called a force vital capacity called a FVC, that's a pulmonary function test that you'll be doing a little later. But you'll learn in your COPD patients, you know they can't get the air out, right? So their force bottle capacity maneuver is lower than mine and yours because we can get the air out. So if they can't blow real fast and get it out, then that means they can't cough, 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 right? They, their cough is weaker than yours, all right? It may be a lot more going on. They may be coughing all the time because they got so much junk because they smoke, but the strength of their cough is less than somebody who does not have COPD. So if they can't cough good, then the, the secretions become trapped, right? And they stay in there. And so now we may have to turn them and drain that on out because he can't or she can't cough good, all right? Dehydration, somebody who's not drinking enough water, that could be a problem, okay? Uh, and acute pulmonary disease, that means some kind of disease that happened over like interstitial lung disease, pneumonia, ARDS, uh, uh, anything like that that's not chronic but acute that just happened, right? You got sick and now your lungs are ill, okay? 
And then sometimes we can do postural drainage prophylactically because we know Mr. Johnson got COPD. Every winter he get full of secretions. He can't breathe hardy, hardly good. So he's going to get full. So we have to go ahead and drain him. Even if I don't see it, I'm going to go and drain him because I know his superior segment always fills up. Every time he come, you come every winter and your superior segment or whatever is always full, right? And so since I know my patient, I'm going to just go ahead and prophylactically do it, okay? Prophylactically do it. Now, uh, don't forget your positions for each segment. So when you look at this PowerPoint as you study, you can say, okay, right, upper, low, apical, anterior, posterior. And you can go ahead and tell yourself, okay, where, where do I, which way would I turn them? And compare these to your notes, okay? Compare these to your notes without looking at your notes to see if you can figure out which way to turn your patient without looking, okay? So my right upper low, my apical segment, and my anterior and my posterior. Well, I know for my right upper low, if it's my anterior section of my right upper lung, I already know the anterior is in the front portion of my right upper lung. So I'm already thinking I'm going to be semi-fowlers, right? Because my, I want that lung sitting up, but I want it kind of back this way so it'll drain from the front to the middle because anterior is in the front. If it's my posterior segment of my right upper lobe, I'm probably going to do like this, sitting, leaning forward. Right, so the back section of my upper lung can drain to the middle. Okay, make sure I'm sitting up but leaning forward. All right, so those are the things that you have to kind of start to wrap your mind around where these segments are and how would I get them up in the air. Okay, how would I get them up in the air? So do the same thing with those with the rest of those positions. Try your best to um, not look at the paper, but if you have to, do it. Because you can do it without looking. All right, so some contraindications for postural drainage, uh, empyema, flail chest, if they have wounds, spinal cord injuries, a pneumothorax, head injuries, unstable cardiac status, some COPD patients, the ones who can't have their head of the bed down. Not all, because if it says what are the indications for, COPD is an indication and a contraindication. So don't forget that. Don't say, well, COPD not, because that's a contraindication. I thought it said, no, COPD is an indication and a contraindication. It's only contraindicated in those COPD patients who cannot tolerate the head of their bed being down. Some can, some can't, okay? Because they simply can't exhale well, they will start to accumulate more secretions because they can't blow it out, all right? They can't cough it out really well. But others cannot have their head of their bed and they, oh, let me up, let me up, let me up, or I can't breathe. So you can't do it for them. If that's if it's a lower lobe, you can't do them because lower lobe is going to have them down, right? Now, if it's in their upper, then it's fine, right? So it just depends on where it is and if the patient can tolerate his head being down. All right, so if it says what all the indications, make sure you add COPD because that is an indication, but it's also a contraindication if they can't have their head down. All right, obesity, pregnancy, and recent meals. All right, percussion. We went from bland aerosols. That didn't work. So let's try to drain. That's not working. Well, we're gonna add some stuff to the drainage. While I got them turned this way, prone or whatever way I have them turned, now I'm going to do a little percussion on him and start to hit his back, clapping the chest wall in that segment, right? Not gonna uh, clap on the left side if the segment is on the right, all right? I'm gonna lay him on his left side. If the right side is affected, then I'm going to put him on his left side to let that right side drain. And as it's draining, I'm going to add some clapping of the chest wall uh, to help beat it out of the segments. So it says when it's difficult to mobilize secretions, that's when you want to add that percussion. You turned them, right? Postural drainage alone might not be effective. So if you got them turned for drainage, but it's just still not coming out, well, then let's go ahead and do a little bit of percussion. Now, 
some of the same indications or kind of indications for percussion. You don't want to hit on somebody with empyema. Empyema is pus and disease pus in a uh, uh, segment of the lung. If I have some, if I have some empyema in my anterior segment of my right upper lobe, and I drain them, put them in fowlers, like, like 30 degrees, something like that, then it's going to drain that infected pus into maybe the posterior segment, right? We don't want it to drain. We want it to stay where it is. And we go down and get that with a bronchoscope. Bronchoscopy will go down with the camera into the segments. You can see where you are. It's kind of like playing a video game. You go into the trachea. You can see the trachea wall, the rings, and then you know to go to left or the right main stem bronchus, and then you go to where you're looking for. And you have a little thumb control that will move the camera up and down where it makes it turn and go where you want it to go. Once I get to that segment, I will see that nasty empyema, empyema right there, okay? Uh, side note, ain't that thing from Taco Bell called the empyema? The apple thing? Ugh, I used to love them things. Maybe they I, think something called, else. I think they're called empanadas or something like that. Oh, oh. I'm about to say, because I have just thought about pus color. That's almost like apple color. And I'm like, ugh, I used to love them things. But okay, good. I'm glad they're not empanadas. All right. So if I have the bronchoscope, I will go and get that myself and suck that out. Because the scope not only has a camera, but it has a suction port. I can suction out with that. It also has graspy clips if I want to insert graspy clips through the cord. And if there's a tumor or something, then I can go and grab a piece of it from your actual uh, segment. That's respiratory, right? Uh, usually the doctor does all of the manip uh, manipulating, but if you have a, a doctor who's a pulmonologist that trusts respiratory like ours do at the hospital, they let me do them. So he said, I want a bronchi. He has to be in the room though. And so we'll set them up, we'll sedate the patient, and I'll go in and get whatever I need to get, right? We'll send it off to the lab and see if it's infected, all right? But when somebody has an empyema, you don't want to do percussion or drainage because you don't want it to spread, okay? Uh, flail chest, flail chest, that's two or more broken ribs in two or more places, okay? So two or more ribs that are broken in two or more places, right? That's flail chest, you don't want that. You don't want to be beating on somebody with broke ribs. Wounds, of course. Frank homoptosis. What did I say homoptosis was? Bright red blood coming from the... Coughing it up. Coughing it up, yeah. So coughing up bright red blood. That's Frank homoptosis, because homoptosis is coughing up blood. Frank homoptosis is bright red blood. Okay, that means it's fresh, close to where you're coughing from, all right? Anticoagulant therapy, somebody who's on heparin. If they're on heparin or warfarin or anything that is for blood thinning, right? We don't want to be beating on them because they will bruise easy. Pain or intolerance, if it just hurts. Look, that hurts, stop, okay? Then you stop. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a highly, highly contagious Airborne lung disease. Uh, you start beating on that, they're gonna start coughing up tuberculosis on you, which looks like cottage cheese. Okay, when they cough up cottage cheese into their hand, they have tuberculosis. But by that moment, it's too late. You didn't got it. If you don't have an N95 mask on, they coughing up cottage cheese. You got it. Okay, you have it. That's why we test you for it every day because it's very, very contagious. It's at bay right now, but it could come back at any time, okay? Metastasize cancer. If cancer is already spreading, you don't want to start beating and possibly making pieces break off into the bloodstream and cause cancer somewhere else, okay? Because if you start beating on that tumor, it may break off. Little micro pieces might break off and go into another section, get into the blood uh, and cause cancer in other places. Okay, so those are some of the common indications of percussion. The technique, of course, is to avoid the sternum, the spine, and brony structures. You can use a towel or something to keep from smacking on the skin. And always examine the skin for redness, tears, bruises, any kind of effect. 
and you want to stay on each segment for about three to five minutes, okay? And it seems like a lifetime when you're doing it. Then I do all of this, and then there's another technique I can do as they exhale. So as I got him turned on his right side, right, I'm beating on his left chest, all right? And now I'm almost done. I'm going to tell him to take a deep breath in and exhale. When he exhales, I will shake him as he exhales, right? That's called vibration. Tensing your arms together, keeping your elbows locked and straight, and shake from the shoulders when they exhale. You can use it with percussion, or you can use it alone if percussion is not indicated, okay? If they can't take the pain or can't turn or whatever for percussion, then just shake them as they exhale. That can, that can kind of help as well. And now we use not only our arms to do the shaking, but we have some devices. We have a device called the flutter device that does the same thing. It gives a shaking motion in the lungs when they exhale, okay? So we don't see that hardly anymore at all, right? The shaking you hardly ever see. People just do the acapella or the flutter or something like that for the shaking. Or the vest that I showed you yesterday. The vest will also shake you, all right? Uh, Ms. Cummins will tell you how it shook her. All right, mechanical percussors and vibrators. Those are the little handheld percussors and vibrators that we can use to shake the stuff off of the segment, okay? Uh, you don't want to use any kind of percussors around the kidney-ish uh, area. Make sure you know that's the lower back, right? That lower left or lower right back is where your kidneys are, okay? That's why they outlaw those in boxing. You can't do a kidney punch. You'll be disqualified because that's not good. You can shake the kidney and it'll fall, and that's a problem. It'll hurt like a month. Can't pee and all that, so that's that's bad. You know, the kidneys are only like a, um, only thick as like three or four pieces of paper, right? The kidney is only, the kidney is only about this thick, right? It's about that thick, and probably about this big. It's not big at all. When you, when you put this in your back, it ain't that big. It's not big. It's not big. It's not thick. It's thicker, thinner than you think, and it can slide or fall if uh, if knocked out of place. So don't percuss over the kidney area um, or, or breast tissue, right? Don't, don't, don't males, don't, or women, don't go over somebody and start beating right over the breast, okay? You can kind of raise the breast up with your arm if you're a male and kind of pop on the side like that because you want to make sure you uh, always keep your patient's integrity uh, and, and, and dignity intact, okay? I don't ever want them to think that you're doing nothing extra, no matter what it is. I had to do CPT on a 90-year-old lady who at 30 years old had breast implants. And now she's 90, everything is wrinkled except them breasts. <laughs> everything was like, oh, you know, you could see her veins and everything in her body, but the breasts were just sitting there like, just sitting there, just perfect skin and everything. I was like, that was really weird, okay? Uh, and when she came in, the sheet was just over her body. It was just like, she was like skinny as like maybe 80 pounds, but the breast was like 50 pounds. It was just really weird. I was like, how is her skin even holding that? Okay. So you can't let that bother you. You have to find a way around breast tissue, around the breast area, because you want to keep her dignity, right? Cover them up. Uh, put this, pull the, you can pull the covers up over the breast and just do what you need to do. Even when you do an EKG, when you do an EKG, try to keep the breast covered, right? You want to try to keep the, at least the nipple line covered as possible. Okay, just put your stickers on, go up under and put them around the side and be keep your dignity as much as possible. Uh, of course, you can use a towel or a sheet to prevent from smacking on the skin and use electrical precautions uh, when you're doing um, electrical units. When I'm using electrical percussors and vibrators, make sure I'm not right with somebody who's getting oxygen right, right there while I'm with the electrical right there in their face. Be careful with that, okay? Be careful. All right. There's a couple of patient cases I want you guys to focus on now. I'm just going to give a couple of scenarios. Okay, let's look at a couple of scenarios. Patient number one, I'm going to read it all and then I'm going to pause the video while you think about it. Matter of fact, what time is it? It's break time? Let's see. It's 8.50. So let's take a 10-minute break. Come back at 9 o'clock. We're going to work on these patient cases. We got about two or three patient cases we're going to miss. The first one is Miss Winnie Kirkwood. All right, so let's take a 10-minute break. I'm going to pause the recording. 
Come back at nine o'clock and we will start on Miss Winnie Kirkwood and answer these little questions. All right, guys, so we're back now on focus on uh, 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 on that uh, case study, Miss, I think it was Wilkers or something like that. Let's look at it. All right, Miss Winnie Kirkwood. Miss Winnie Kirkwood. Hey, Miss Winnie Kirkwood is a 76 year old female. And then when you read this, I want you to think about everything you've learned to this point. Okay, everything that you've learned to this point, try to put it together for either your diagnosis or what you would do, right? Things like that. Miss Winnie Kirkwood is a 76-year-old female admitted this morning with shortness of breath, progressing over the last 24 hours. Patient has a history of COPD. She is alert and possibly confused. She is in a regular room, okay? Physical findings. Pulse, 108, regular. The blood pressure is 102 over 70. Temperature is 38.4 degrees Celsius. Respiratory rate is 22 and shallow. Breath sounds are decreased, ronchi in the basis. Patient has an occasional cough, which appears to be productive. Patient is swallowing mucus. So she's coughing it up, but she's swallowing it. Patient is in a semi-fowler position and she is slightly overweight. Those are your physical findings. Laboratory data, so we get some blood on her. We got an ABG, ABG says 7.37, CO2 of 60, bicarbonate 34, PaO2 46. She sat in 78%. FiO2 at nasal cannula at one liter per minute, her hemoglobin is 15.8. White blood count is 13,100. 13, okay? Now, so think about all of those things that you just learned about her. Now, the order, the order that the doctor gave was increase the oxygen to five liters per minute, administer two puffs of Ventolin, which is albuterol, uh, during a meter dose inhaler. Okay, Q4. First one was, would you implement this order as it's written? Second one was, would you recommend it? What would you recommend in its place? And would, why, uh, would you add or delete anything from this order? So looking at what you're looking at, you gotta learn how to break these patients down. The patient has a fever, right? She has a fever. So what is her fever in Fahrenheit? First, I want you to tell me what is her fever in Fahrenheit? So she has a 101.1 fever, right? Respirations are 22, but they're what? Shallow, okay? She's got ronchi in the basis, all right? Her white blood count is high, right? Five to 10,000 is what it should be. If it's 13,000, she has a what? Infection, okay? She has an occasional cough, which appears to be productive, so that's good, but she's swallowing the mucus, all right? So she's coughing it up, okay? Uh, she's slightly overweight. She's sitting up in a fowler's position, in my fowler's position, and she has a history of what? COPD, okay? So let's go on it. What is her ABG show? Is it fully compensated respiratory acidosis? Fully compensated respiratory acidosis. 7.37 is still in normal range, but it's leaning what? Acid. CO2 is acid, bicarb is alkaline. So CO2 is causing the problem. So it's a respiratory acidosis. The third player is bicarb. Is he in normal range? Is bicarb, no, he's not in normal range. So we do have compensation. And was his compensation enough to get us back to normal range for pH? 
Yes. So it's fully compensated respiratory acidosis. Excellent. What about the oxygenation status? PaO2 of 46. What is that? It's severe hypoxemia. Not severe. Severe, yeah. is, severe will be less than 40. Moderate. Moderate. But since she's on one liter of oxygen, it's considered to be, she's not on room air, she's on one liter of oxygen. She's still not getting enough for her. What's it called? What's that called when they're on oxygen, but you didn't correct it? Uncorrected. 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 Uncorrected uh, hypoxemia, right? And so the uh, uh, patient is on uncorrected hypoxemia. So it's fully compensated respiratory acidosis with uncorrected hypoxemia. Now, in this case, I'm not concerned with the ABG as far as the acid base status because it's, it's compromised. It's compensated, right? It's doing its job. I am concerned with the oxygenation. She sat in 78% and her PaO2 is really low. It's too low, okay? So I'm going to give her some more what? Oxygen. Oxygen, okay. So do I agree? Do you agree to give her five liters of oxygen? Increase yes. Five liters. Yes. Okay, you say yes. What? Anybody else say anything different? I say no because I thought we want them to be mildly hypoxic. Well, she's not They're moderate though. She's moderately hypoxic. Well, she does need the oxygen. The, the question is not how much to give her, it's how to give it. How should you be giving this patient oxygen if she has COPD? And well, how's she breathing? Shallow. So is that regular and consistent? No. no. So you need to give it. So you need a non a non rebreather. No, that's too much oxygen. Not a non rebreather. Just give her a what? Sample O2. No. It would be a Venturi mask. Venturi. <laughs> you want to get a high flow system. Remember when they have a inconsistent regulatory pattern. Not to mention she got COPD. You want to give them a fixed FiO2. So no matter how she breathes, she's going to only get that FiO2 that you give her, okay? So we definitely want to give her more oxygen. So instead of five liters, we would probably give her what percent Venturi? 40. 40% 40 Venturi. That's how you break down a patient, okay? Now, uh, Lord. <laughs> but you have to look at your history. The patient has COPD, so you know that they have a tendency to have O2 induced hypoventilation, right? They already said that she's breathing shallow. So that ain't, that's not normal. How did y'all come up with the 40%? Huh? How did y'all come up to give her 40%? Because five, five liters, liters is 40 per, uh, it's on the Venturi, I know that, but uh, 40 liters per minute is the, the FiO2 is 40. So if the patient, Remember the rule of fours, uh, Ms. Cummings. Five yes, I know. But I thought uh, I thought you you all said that we weren't giving her uh, what we suggested. We were giving her more. Yeah, we got We got to give her some more oxygen because she's only sat in seventy eight percent, and her PaO two is forty six. That's too much hypoxia. I didn't say I don't want her to be. I don't want you. Don't want them to be moderately hypoxic. You just want them to be mildly hypoxic. Okay. If they're sat in around 89, 90, that's okay. PaO2 about 60, something like that, that's okay. But 46, that's too much. So we definitely want to give more oxygen. The order is to give her more oxygen. All right, we do want to do that. But we don't want to give her oxygen in a nasal cannula. We don't want to go up to five liters on a nasal cannula because she doesn't have a consistent regulatory pattern. Okay, so since she doesn't have a consistent ventilatory pattern, we do not want a low flow system. The nasal cannula is a low flow. low flow system. So we need to go to a high flow system. So I would just go up to a Venturi mask at 40% because five liters, if he was looking at that on the nasal cannula, that would be about 40%, all right? And that will bump up that oxygen and we can get another ABG a little later and see what it is then, 
But for right now, you need to put this patient, because of their history and the way that they're breathing, a high flow system. That's what they want you to see. This patient needs to be on a high flow system, okay? And not only that, you didn't have to be Ventura. It could have been a 40% aerosol face mask. That would have been fine too, right? Long as a high flow system is gonna give them that fixed FIO2, no matter how they breathe. If they said she was breathing normal, then I would have went on up to five liters on the nasal cannula, okay? But since she's not breathing normal, she's breathing shallow. So I have to be careful with that because five liters and they're breathing shallow, that's gonna be a really lot of FIO2 because she's barely breathing. And so it's going to be a whole lot of FIO2 going down every breath, okay? So that's how you have to break that down, all right? Now, the other part was, okay, so we know we're going to give her more oxygen, and we're not going to give her through a nasal cannula. We're not going to just increase the five liters. We're going to switch her to a high flow system, okay? You got that part, Ms. Cummins? Yes, I got it. Okay. So we got to go to a high flow system because she's breathing shallow. That's first of all, okay? And so if you said 28% or 30%, I mean, that's not a big deal. But since they said five liters, let's just go with 40% of a high flow system, okay? Whether it's a Venturi mask or aerosol face mask, aerosol face tent, but she didn't, they didn't say nothing about her having a trait. So you don't do a trait call or nothing like that, okay? All right. And so now they're talking about giving two puffs of albuterol, all right? Well, they said she has a good cough, and it said the uh, um, the breath sounds were ronca in the basis. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Let's give her something to open her up some, okay? Because albuterol, which is Ventolin, will open them up some, okay? So no, I don't agree with the order as it's written. I would say no, let's go with an aerosol, a face mask or a Venturi mask, something like that for 40%. If that's what we want to do to get some more oxygen, and then Yes, I will go ahead and do the MDI uh, every four hours. Okay, so that's cool. So that's what they want you to be able to do. Break down your patient. You got to look at the patient. She's a 60-year-old female. She has COPD. So we already know that. And she's probably just chronic. She's got COPD. So we know that a COPD blood gas is not that, uh, it's, it's different than ours. It, you know what I'm saying? So that blood gas right there is classic COPD because they are chronic co2 retainers right so their co2 is always going to be high in the in the abg it's always going to be high and the bicarb is always going to be high because it has had time to compensate because they didn't have copd for years so their bicarb has compensated for that and their ph is always in normal range leaning acid but it's all the way back to normal range so that is a normal blood gas for a copd -er. however the oxygenation status is a little low, okay? So we do have to address the oxygenation in this case, and that's how you would address it, okay? She has a white blood count of 13,000, so of course we're probably gonna add. What else would you add to that order? What else would you think should be added? Antibiotics. Antibiotics. She needs an antibiotic because her white blood count is 13,000. It should be five to 10,000. So it's up. She has a bacterial infection. So bacterial infections, we treat with antibiotics. Okay. So when you get to the next lesson, which is pharmacology, you're going to be able to say, oh, which one would you give? Right? Because we give a couple of antibiotic inhalations. We give gentamicin and tobramycin. Okay. Those are two antibiotic medicines we give aerosol. Okay. All right. Let's look at Mr. Keister. Kip Keister. Kip Keister is a 52-year-old male. He had a colon resection two days ago. So he had surgery two days ago. Okay. Patient is alert and oriented. He is in a regular room on the surgical floor. He had a 30-pack year history of smoking. So he has what? COPD. All right, so we know he got COPD too. Because he's been drinking, I mean, he's been smoking two packs a day for 15 years. That's a 30 pack year history. Okay. All right. Physical findings. His pulse rate is 110 in regular. Uh, his blood pressure is 158 over 90, a little elevated. 
Temperature 38.8 degrees, so he's febrile. Respirations are 24 and shallow. Breath sounds are decreased with ronchi on exhalation throughout. So every time he exhales, you hear the ronchi, right? Low pitch wheezes are ronchi. High pitch wheezes or high pitch sounds are wheezes and low pitch sounds they call ronchi, okay? So he has them all throughout. That means throughout the whole lung, you hear that. Chest expansion is decreased at the basis. So when he takes a breath, his chest doesn't expand that good at the basis. Patient has an uh, occasional weak, non-productive cough. So occasionally he will cough, and when he does cough, it's very weak and it's not productive. That means he's not producing anything, right? His skin is warm and moist. I know what that means. Warm and moist. So he's kind of clammy, right? Warm and kind of clammy, pale, probably uh, sweating, like a, a little sweat, okay? His satin, all right, he's 94% on room air. Okay, on room air, he's 94%. All right, the order is in center spirometry, Q2 hours, administer 0.5 cc's of a bronchodilator with some, okay. You haven't gotten that far yet. I don't know why this one's in this lesson, but Incentive spirometry is what you're going to get to when we go to um, um, hyperinflation. And yes, I would agree with that. That's something that gives you, uh, makes you breathe bigger, right? The incentive spirometer is this little device right here. Okay, you uh, inhale into it. This little device right here, they would inhale. I'm pretty sure you've seen this before or you used it before, but you would inhale in it and it helps inflate those lungs, right? Hyperinflate your own lungs. And since they said his cough is weak and occasional, his expansion is low, this is going to make him open up, all right? So, yes, I would give him this and give him a bronchodilator because he's wheezing or has ronchi all the way through his lung, okay? So, yeah, I should have looked at that before I read it. All right, let's look at the next page and see if we can do that one. All right. Okay, yes, yeah, let's look at this one. Jonathan Harker. Jonathan Harker is a 70-year-old male admitted to this morning with an exacerbation of ulcerative colitis. Exacerbation means you already got it, but it's acting up, okay? Um, his colitis is acting up. So patient has a long history of COPD and has COPD for a long time, okay? He is alert and oriented and in a regular room and has an IV. So they got an IV started. Okay, he's in a regular room watching a little TV, okay? His pulse is 98 and regular, blood pressure 132 over 92. His temperature is 37.6, or small fever, right? Uh, respiration 22, and they didn't say shallow, so it must be normal. Breath sounds are clear in the apices. So up at the top, the breath sounds are clear. Scattered ronchi around in the bases. Occasional productive cough of white sputum and patient is resting comfortably in the bed, okay? Lab data, his SAT is 92% on two liters. His hemoglobin is 12.8, white blood count 12,300. All right, so they're saying should you, the order is to increase his oxygen to four liters and give him some a bronchodilator, okay? So do we want to, so what we're going to focus on is do we want to increase his oxygen to four liters? What do you no. think? No. No. He good because he has a long history of what? COPD. So two liters is good enough for him. 92% sat is fine for him. Okay. That's mildly hypoxic. Okay. That's perfect. Hemoglobin is, is all right. White blood counts up a little bit. So they may give him a little... I, I, uh, he got an IV, so they may give him a little dose of uh, antibiotic or something like that. Uh, so I will probably add a little antibiotic. As far as the isoetherine, that is a, one of the uh, staple medicines that you'll hear about in pharmacology that is a bronchodilator, even though we don't hardly ever use it anymore. Uh, isoetherine, also known as bronchosol, is uh, what we don't, we don't use that much. It's still out there now, but it's one of the first bronchodilators that ever was invented. And so they saying, give him a little bronchodilator mixed with normal saline. So yeah, I would probably do that because he has some scattered 
Lanka in the basin. So I'll probably give him a little breathing treatment and sit him down and watch TV, okay? Give him a breathing treatment, sit down, let him watch TV. They may give him a little dose of antibiotics, okay? So good. Your answer to keep him on two liters was good. No, I'm not going to increase it to four. Everybody understand that? Yes. Anybody not understand why we would keep him at two liters? All right. All right, let's see what you think about this one. Let's see what you think about this one. Mina Seward, 60-year-old female. She got admitted last night from a nursing home with an increasing shortness of breath, getting shorter and shorter, and, and an increase in temperature. She's got a fever now. She is minimally responsive. Now she ain't really responding to you no more. She's in a regular room. She has an IV. Pulse is 104, but thready. That means it's, you can barely feel it, okay? But blood pressure is dropping at 96 over 42. Temperature, 38.8 degrees. Respirations, 30 and shallow. Breath sounds are decreased. You barely hear it throughout with ronchi on exhalation. Patient has occasional weak, non-productive cough, and her skin is warm and dry. Let's look at her lab. Her pH is 7.52, CO2 of 28, bicarb of 23, a PaO2 of 44, she's satin 83%, FiO2 on room air, hemoglobin is only 10, and white blood count is 11,200. All right, so look back at your patient again. Look at how she, what is symptoms is she exhibiting? All right, look at how she's examined, how she's presenting, okay? This is how she's presenting in front of you. You look at your physical findings. Now, the order is to intubate. Place her on 60% oxygen via uh, T2, I mean T2 to an ET endotracheal tube. Uh, I wouldn't have done that. But, so what do you... Uh, would you implement it as written or would, what would you recommend in this place? And what would you, would you delete anything from this order? So the first thing is, do you agree to intubate this patient? Yes. No. Yes. What? The patient is minimally responsive. She's about to die in your face. Her blood pressure is dropping. She is minimally responsive. That means when you call her name, she doesn't respond. Okay. You have to really do something to make her, respond like move to pain or something like that she's she's going out on you kayla she's about to she's about to crash okay this patient is actively crashing okay she don't have copd so there's no reason for her co2 to i mean her uh, oxygen to be so low right she is minimally respond that is her key word right there whenever you got a patient that's not responding blood pressure is dropping respirations are shallow barely they barely they're doing it fast and shallow it's time to intubate Okay, don't start looking for little small things to do. Now it's time to intubate this patient, okay? And not only am I going to intubate, I'm not going to give her a T-piece. I'm not going to put aerosol T-piece on her. I'm going to put her on a ventilator. It's time to intubate her and put her on a ventilator, okay? So we can figure out what's going on, all right? That is what you would do in this case. So yes, you would intubate immediately. It's time to go ahead and give her a little, uh, she got an IV, let's go ahead and give her a little medication to make her sedate her even more. And we're going ahead and drop this too. It's time to breathe for her because you're about to start cold blue in her real soon, okay? She's on her way out and then it's gonna be harder to intubate while everybody's doing chest compressions, okay? So it's time to intubate your patient. Your blood pressure is low as, I mean, that's super low, 96, over 42 that almost doesn't even sustain life. It's really, really low, okay? You understand, Kayla? I understand. Uh, what confused me was the minimally responsive. Like if it said completely unresponsive, I would have been like, okay, intubate. But I'm like, what is minimally response? Yeah, so you have, if, if you walk up on somebody and they're not responsive at all, of course you intubate. But if they're minimally responsive, that means they are impending respiratory failure. They're on their way out. You don't, you don't always have to 
react. Sometimes you have to be proactive with your intubation. If you see that they're on their way out, you go ahead and try to intubate them before they crash. Because sometimes- And like the, the, the pulse and the blood pressure didn't really alarm me because I see that a lot in the nursing home anyways, and these people would be up in their chairs and well, like it, it would be normal for them. Not if it's, not if it's thready. If it's thready, they, should, they won't be up and about. Thready means okay. you can barely feel it because the blood pressure is so low that you can barely feel it. Okay, that okay. blood pressure, anybody with a 96 over 42 is not up walking around doing nothing. Okay, that's a low blood pressure. Now, they, they might be laying there, but they won't be getting up or being able to do much because they're on their way out. So, yeah, it might be 104. That's fine, right? I mean, it'd be 120. You know, some people are higher than others. But if it's thready, that kind of gets okay. It's already thready. Uh, her respirations are very shallow. She has a deep, she's minimally, minimally responsive. Blood pressure is dropping. Oh, yeah, it's, it's time to go ahead and tube her. Okay, we're going to go ahead and tube her, most definitely. What is her ABG? Uncompensated alkaline respiratory. Uncompensated, uncompensated respiratory alkalosis. pH is alkaline. pH is alkaline. CO2 is alkaline. Bicarb is normal. 22 to 26. Bicarb is not in not in uh it's not out of normal range. It's normal. So there is no compensation going on. So it's just uncompensated respiratory uh, uh, alkalosis. Respiratory alkalosis. All right, uh, her PaO2 is 44, so she's severely, I mean, I mean, uh, moderately hypoxic, right? And she does not have a history of COPD, so that's a problem, right? That's not, you know, that's 83% that's is not good for anybody, but definitely not for somebody who does not have COPD. All right, that's Miss Sewer. Last one, last one, and we're gonna work on some of these uh, quizzes for aerosol and humidity. Miss. Oh, I guess it's Duke. Duke, Lucella, Lucilla, or Lucilla. <laughs> I don't know who come up with these names. 42-year-old male, so he's not really old, my age. 42-year-old male admitted this morning or this afternoon with an exacerbation of scoliosis. I'm silico, no, silico, silicosis, silicosis. Silicosis. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, um, some type of, uh, I think that's a lung disease. Um, Patient is alert and oriented. He in a regular room with an IV in place. Okay. So if you don't know what silicosis is, now we need to look at this the findings. Let's treat the patient. What is this? What is his blood and his body saying? Okay. His pulse is 96 and 30. Blood pressure is okay, 134, 134 over 90. It's okay. Um, temperature 38 degrees straight up, respiratory rate. 26 and shallow. Breath sounds are very decreased. So you can hardly hear them. You listen to his lung sounds, but you don't hear anything. All the way through his whole lung, you don't hardly hear nothing. Okay. All right. Chest expansion is very decreased. Okay. Very decreased. Patient is, is not coughing. Okay. Uh, let's see here. pH is 7.42. CO2 of 30. Bicarbon 19. And a PaO2 of 58, sitting at 82%. He's on two liters already, okay? Hemoglobin 16.4, white blood count 10,600. So it's not really elevated much to sneeze at. All right, so they say they want to increase the oxygen to five liters per minute and give some atrovent, uh, puffs, two, uh, two puffs Q6. So don't worry about the medicine aspect. Just think about the oxygen. Um, with this patient, do I want to increase the oxygen to five liters per minute on his current thing? He's on a nasal cannula. Okay, you say no. Anybody say anything different? No. Okay. So what do you want to use? A high flow system. Why why do we need to use a high flow system? But no, why do we need to use a high flow to do that? 
There's a reason in him, his findings. What is the reason? What is what is he telling you why he needs a high flow system? He has shallow breathing. Shallow and the respiratory rate is what? 26. 26. Respiratory rate of 26 and shallow. He needs a high flow system right off the bat. Okay? <clears throat> that is not an indication for low flow system. 300 to 700, respiratory rate about 25 or less, and normal consistent ventilatory pattern. That's the most important part right there. So he got, he's, they're telling you he's shallow and he's breathing 26. So we already know off the bat, we need a high flow system. We need a high flow system for him. What does his, uh, his ABG say? Fully compensated respiratory alkalosis. Okay, you say fully compensated respiratory alkalosis. Anybody say anything different? Okay. With well. mild hypoxia, hypoxemia. Yeah, mild hypoxemia. Okay. There you go. pH is in normal range, so it is fully compensated respiratory alkalosis, right, with mild hypoxemia. Mild hypoxemia. His white blood count is up just a little bit. We probably will watch it before they just start dumping at, uh, uh, antibiotics on him. Okay, you want your body to fight as much as possible. All right, you only start dumping antibiotics when it's over, like it's like 12,000, 13,000, 15,000. I've seen them at 30 and 20,000. Okay, so you don't want to, you know, as soon as you get a little bit of infection, you start giving antibiotics. Let the body work it because the more you do that, the more the body stops fighting diseases. That's why they don't want to give your babies antibiotics. As soon as they're born, you start giving antibiotics. Moxicillin, moxicillin, every time they get a sneeze, right? But then the body stops fighting that stuff. And start getting tolerant to it, okay? And it, it won't work no more. All right, so yes, we would increase his oxygen. I'd bump him up to about four or five liters and go from there, okay? Four or five liters would be fine. Now, I would definitely give him some type of... Um, uh, breathing treatment, because his breath sounds are what? No, the sound. Decreased. Very decreased. So he's not moving any air. We got to open them lungs up. We definitely have to open those lungs up. So we're definitely going to, I'm going to not only give him some oxygen, I'm going to give him some a breathing treatment, right? Uh, and I probably wouldn't do atrovin. I'll probably do albuterol, because that is a Albuterol is a bronchodilator. Adjuvant kind of keeps you from closing. So if you already close, adjuvant won't work. Okay, you already close. So I would give him some albuterol, some oxygen, more oxygen through his nasal cannula, and I probably give him an incentive spirometer. This right here. All right, give him this so he can pop them lungs back open because evidently they're closing. Okay, they're closing. All right. All right, so let's look at a couple of uh, class work. Let's work, work on some class work. Uh, was any questions on the homework last night? I almost graded the homework uh, for accuracy last night because I saw a couple of people for number one on homework number one. Number one on homework number one. Somebody put, somebody put because, because it's less combustible when humidified. Now that's just, that, that sounds like to me, just put anything, okay? It's the question says, therapeutic gas being delivered to patients need to be humidified. Why? And somebody put, because they're less combustible when humidified. No, okay, that, that's that's not why we, we, we never say anything like that, right? We never say anything like that. So therapeutic mass gas needs to be humidified because they are supplied at an anhydrous state. They're dry. Medical gas is really, really dry. So we have to put a little bit of fluid on it so you don't dry the patient out. Not because it's less combustible, okay? Because it didn't say oxygen, it just said therapeutic gas. It could have been anything, okay? Oxygen is the only thing that 
supports combustion. What if they were talking about room air? That's not combustible, right? Or or um, um, nitrogen or something like that. So don't just be putting anything to get to get credit for the day. I don't know. Oh, that's A, C, B, D, here. A, B, take pictures of it and send it out. Don't do that because you're, you're only hurting yourself, okay, if you do that. So are there any questions? We have homework number one, two, and one. And three or just one and two? Okay, one, two, and three. So are there any questions on the homework? If it is, we'll go over some of that now. I have a question on homework number two. All right. It said list the uh, number eight says list the three hazards of CPT, but I wasn't sure if it was the uh, um, they didn't list it as ha hazards. They listed as give me one second. Let me look in the notes. Kind of indication. I, yeah, is That's that the same thing? You would have put that. That would have been all right. Because, you know, what's some hazards if, if if I am doing? I could bruise the skin because one of the kind of indications is anticoagulant therapy. So if I did do it, one of the hazards would be I could bruise the skin, right? Uh, so what they wanted you to take it a step farther, like we know that an empyema is a contraindication of CPD, but if I do it, I, I, run, I run the hazard of doing what? Okay. I, I, I couldn't figure out what, what, uh, what they meant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, they 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 wanted you not to just put the indications that they wanted you to say, okay, if you did the contraindication and you went ahead and did it, what would be a hazard? So empyema is a pocket of pus and infection. So if I went ahead and did it anyway, what would be a hazard of that? If it's an empyema, spreading infection, right? That would be a hazard. Uh, if I know they're on anticoagulant therapy and I decide to do it anyway, a hazard would be bruising or bleeding, right? Uh, let's see, um, tuberculosis. If I know that they have tuberculosis and I do it anyway, what would be a hazard of that? Huh? Yeah, spreading the infection out in the air, right? I'm making, the, the, um, making it become more airborne, right? And so that's what they wanted you to kind of do on that one. Any other questions on the homework? What about number two on uh, homework number three? Homework number three, question number two. What did y'all get for that one? A. I got B. All right, so a device that produces water in a gaseous form, also known as vapor, is what? Homework number three. Number two. Yeah, it should be A. Should be A, a humidifier, because humidity is water vapor. Water vapor is humidity, so a humidifier will produce water vapor. Okay, that's a humidifier. Can we go over number three on homework one? Okay. Homework one, number three. All right, so in order to prevent secretions from causing problems, in the management of patients with artificial trachea airways, one should uh, suction as frequently as possible, reposition, no, provide 100% renter, no, clean the inner clean for two hours, yeah, suction, you should go out to suction them. Suction them as frequent as possible to keep okay. them from causing the problem, yeah. That would be the best, because you don't want to go in there every five minutes and suction a trach patient, because you don't, you know, you, you can set up infection because you're constantly introducing something to their airway. Uh, so, I mean, but out of those choices, that would be the best one. Repositioning is not going to do anything. Uh, providing 100% relative humidity is just going to keep the secretions coming even more, okay, because you're making it more and more wet. That's what you want to do, though, but that's why you have to suction them because you are providing that. 
uh, clean the inner candle every two hours, no, we'll never get nothing done if we did that. So you'd have to suction them, just suction them. Every time you hear it, whenever you hear it or see it, you get it, okay? You walk by the room and you hear them gargle, 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 go get it, right? Go get it so it doesn't cause a problem. Can we go over number five on homework three? Number five, humidity deficit. What, is, what did we say humidity deficit was? The difference between water vapor and inspired air and alveoli air. Good. Should be B. The deficit. That's the deficit. It means the difference between the humidity, which is water vapor. The difference between the humidity of the outside air and alveolar air is called the humidity deficit. Homework number one and number four. Homework one, number four. Let's see. All right, which of the following devices would be contraindicated for patient whose upper airway has been bypassed? No, I put that. the. If the upper airway has been bypassed, then which or which one of those work on bypass artificial airways? No. The bubble humidifier only works with the what? Small. Not only just the small, but there's only one small device that it be used on. Oh, uh, a low flow system. Sorry, I don't know why I said it's small. low flow system. You're right, low flow system. But there's a particular device in the low flow category that's the only one that the bubble oh, is the used bubble. for. Okay. The bubble is only used for what device? What's the only device we can use with the bubble humidifier? Nasal cannula. Nasal cannula. Nasal cannula. The bubble humidifier, also known as the bubble diffuser, that can only be used with a nasal cannula. Okay? That's this one. This is the bubble humidifier, right? The only one we use on this is the nasal cannula. So if your upper airway is completely bypassed, then you can't use this. This is only for the nose, right? If you bypass the nose, you can't use this. Okay? The rest of them... I picked C for number four, the large volume jet uh, nebulizer. The heated large volume jet nebulizer, those can be, those are all high flow nebulizers, y'all. Those are high flow systems. Those are used for high flow systems. Okay, so Look, the heated large jet is this one. That's this, just with heat on it. This is for, this is not for, this is this is for you would have to use this for a bypass airway. Now you can use this for uh, our uh, aerosol face mask, but they're asking you which one will be contraindicated for a patient who already don't have a face. Okay, just put it like that. The upper, the whole upper airway is gone. So which one of these can you not use on a patient who does not have an upper airway? A nasal cannula. A nasal cannula, which is used as the bubble humidifier. That's the only one that's contra. They don't say indicated. It says contraindicated. That means you don't use it. That's probably what it was. The word said. I completely wrong. <laughs> yeah. Which one of these is contraindicated? That means you cannot use it on a patient who has a bypass airway. Indicated means you can use it. And if that was the case, you could use all of them except for the. Uh, if it said which one of these are indicated for a person who has an upper airway. Well, that would be A, C, and D. You can use all of them on somebody who has a bypass, but it says contraindicated. All right, so that just means which one can you not use on a patient with a bypass upper airway. So make sure y'all looking at those words really close. When you take the test, don't second guess yourself, read it, and choose what you feel. But when you're done, don't just submit, go back and look at each one again and make sure you didn't miss one of the words, all right? And make sure you submit before the time is out. All right, that's all. But look, if you're getting done in five minutes and you're still getting 20s and 30s and 40s, there's no reason for that. I mean, you're going way too fast, way too fast. You got 33 minutes to take the test and some of y'all are getting done in five minutes and failing.
five on homework one. Let's see. According to ANSI standards, the minimum level of absolute humidity used to deliver therapeutic gases to a patient whose upper airway is bypassed is, I have to look that one up. Did you find it in the reading? I don't, I'm, on, I'm not even going to tell you that the lie on that one. I don't know what that one is. I don't, I don't remember the ANSI standards for minimum, uh, but it's probably in the reading. If you didn't see it in the reading, I'd have to look it up. I'm not sure. Don't worry about that one. That's definitely not a test question. But if you found it in the reading, let us know. Stuff like that you can try to Google too. When you look and you don't know, type in ANSI standards for minimum level of absolute humidity. See if it gives you a number. Any more? Any more on homework one? Number six. Don't, and don't forget, yeah, got a backside to homework number one. Number six. Number six. Providing saturated gas to the airway at a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius can result in which one of the following? I googled hyperpyrexia. I didn't know what that was. And uh -huh. I I selected one and two over hydration. What was hyperoxia? Hyper pyrexia. Oh, uh, you gonna make me Google it again? It was something about high fluid. Okay, that's probably what it is, uh, because uh, that's kind of a tricky question. Because I mean, that's what we want to do, guys. We want to provide saturated gas to the airway. Uh, at a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. That's what we want. Oh, high fever. Very high fever. High, high fever? Oh, well, then I don't, I don't, I don't think about, I don't think so on that one. I don't know what they want you to do on that one. That's kind of strange. I don't see how, because uh, 37 degrees should not contribute to a high fever. That's normal body temperature. So I don't know what they, I don't know what they're getting at on that one. Um, well, it's it says oh, temperature greater. greater than 37. Oh, okay, greater than 37. Okay, there it is, then one and two. One and two, because if it's greater than 37, it has more, it can produce more what? Germs and bacteria. No, <laughs> That's right, but that ain't what we're looking for. What I'm saying is 37 degrees, it can produce 44. And that has potential to produce 44, right? But at greater than 37, it has a higher potential. So right, we have we, we can potentially put too much fluid in a mill. So we want to give 37, but if you've given it at higher than 37, well now you can contribute to a higher temperature in the body and overhydrate them. Yep. So one and two. So that's good. You looked up that word. If you're not sure, look up the word. <laughs> there might be a word that you see on a test question, especially the board exam. It might be some words that you're not familiar. Like so, so that number, that word there is. Uh, could very well be on your board exam. You never know. Whenever you are doing your questions, you do just that. Look up, look that stuff up if you're not sure. Because I didn't even know what it meant. I, I'm, I'm sure I learned it, but I, I forgot. I can't remember everything. So, you know, you have to look at it up and say, oh, okay, yeah, I, now I get that. So if that means contribute to a high temperature and 37 is body temperature, so greater than 37, I'm automatically going to pick that one, right? That's how you do it. Good job. Any more on homework number one? 11. All right, what does the following occur as, a ga as gas leaving a heated humidifier travels to a patient through an unheated delivery tube? And what all is going to happen? Look, what I had on the board over there. Remember that? The temperature, as the temperature drops, what happens? Well, as it out. Okay, so water condenses out of the gas into the tubing. That's one of them. All right, so one is definitely in the question. Okay, so that means A is out. Relative humidity of the gas decreases. When the temperature goes down, what happens to relative humidity? When the, temp when the temperature goes down, the relative humidity stays the same. So two is out. Okay, so let's see. One is in and two is out. So let's get rid of two. So what has to be left? C. C. 
Let me do choices. If you take two out, what's left? If you take choice number two out of all of the answers, then the only answer left is what? C. C. One and three. The temperature, uh, the temperature of the gas decreases. Okay, so as the temperature outside the tube gets lower, the gas is going to get lower and it's going to start to condense and rain out. One and three. So when you're not sure, get rid. Try to get rid of one of the choices. I know that ain't right. Right? So we know that two is not right because we know that when the temperature goes down, relative humidity stays the same. So two is out. So you go ahead and pluck two out of all your choices and the only one you have left is C. Okay, that's how you do that. Because all the rest of the choices, I got two in it. Right, any more on homework number one? All right, homework number two. Any questions on homework number two? All right, any questions on homework number three? All right. So, of course, tonight, homework number four will be due. All right, homework number four is due tonight, which is, I don't know if it's front and back. Let me see. Yep. Homework number four, I got two pages. Matter of fact, homework number four is 20 questions. So it's two pages or three pages, right? It's like one of three, then back is two of three. Then you got front and back, you know, so it's actually three pages, but 20 questions. Yeah. Homer number four, this one. That's what's due tonight. Number four, and there's a number five. I'm not gonna worry about number five. You can work on number five because that helps you study for your oral review. And if you have any questions on that one, you can always ask me so you can be prepared for your orals. But you don't have to. You don't have to submit number five. I want you to submit number four tonight for homework. Okay. All right. So let's look at. Let's take another break. Take another break, and we're gonna come back with some. Sample questions and some quizzes. I'm gonna do some quick, uh, we pull up some quizzes and let you work on them. Trying your best not to use your notes where you can, and then try to um, think them out with what you've learned. Okay, and we'll do a couple of those and we'll stop for today. I'm gonna pause the recording for break. It is 9:56, so let's just say. Take a 15-minute break. Come back at about 10, 10. Just come back at 10, 10. So we can go and get out of here. 10, 10. What's tomorrow? Thursday? Is that the lab yes. and all that? Yes. Okay, okay, yeah, good. Good, good. We're we on, we on good footing. Okay, guys, we're back. We're going to now do a little bit of uh, class work. Um, questions for you to work on. And go over you you may have to use your book try not to use it if you can but if you need to use your book use your book because i promise you some questions on these tests are coming from the reading like uh for instance the bubble diffuser has a pop-off valve okay you need to know what that pop-off valve indicates all right um that's in the reading all right uh, it's not in the lecture, it's in the reading. So if you're not reading at all, then you're going to miss some of these questions that may cause you not to pass the, te the test. All right, so make sure you are in the reading. And that's chapters. Um, and at the Egan's, just focus on the Egan's reading. That's what I'm wanting you to do. Focus on the Egan's book. Okay. Let me see what the syllabus says. What chapter? I'll be forgetting it. Yeah. Also, you guys, I told you that that other book is in. You need to be get, coming and getting it. If you're here, you need to go up there and get that sealed book, comprehensive review, uh, exam review. You need to get that. You guys need to come up here and get that book as soon as possible. It's here, so you need to get it. Uh, let's see. 
So we are on aerosol humidity, chapter 38 and chapter 43 in the Egan's book. Chapter 38 and chapter 43. You should always have that out when you are when we're in lecture. Because if you see something that you read last night, and then I'm in lecture the next day, and then it's like, uh, oh, I saw that in the reading. Or if you saw something in the reading that you want better understanding about, then you can ask it. You can go to that page and, and discuss it, okay? But you got to be in the reading. something about the chapters? Chapter 38 and 43. 38 is emergency cardiovascular life support. So I found chapter 39, which is humidity and blunt aerosol therapy. Oh yeah, it might be some stuff in there, but other things, but the whole chapter is not necessarily over one thing. So just look through the basic therapeutics in there and um, read whatever they want you to get from that. Matter of fact, I'm sorry, matter of fact, uh, chapter chapter 39, chapter 39, right? Chapter 39, y'all should be looking at your Egan's book. So if you're looking at it, you say, oh, humidity and bland aerosol therapy is chapter 39 in the new book, okay? But some of y'all have the old book, and the old book is what was on here. So chapter 39 is humidity and bland aerosol therapy. Let me make sure I'm recording myself. Here I am. Humidity and bland aerosol therapy in chapter 39. So that's what you can be looking at. Everybody go to your book in chapter 39. It's got a lot of great information. You should always have that Egan's book out and uh, active at home. And, and when I look at your book, it should have highlight marks all in it, words and stuff written down if you're studying. If you're not reading, then you're not going to mark it. There's no way to remember everything in there that you read. Have to highlight. So chapter 39, which is uh page 821. Actually, eight eight seventeen. Page 817. Humidity and bland aerosol therapy in the new book. If you got the old book, which none of y'all probably will have the old book at this point, it will be in chapter 38. Okay. But that's, you just have to do that. If you say, well, chapter 39, that ain't got nothing to do with it. When you just look to the, I mean, uh, chapter 38, that ain't got nothing to do with my new book. Then you look at the next chapter. Oh, here it is. Hey, you got to have some ump to look and find it now. It's not, and if you're ever not sure, always go to your index. If we're on aerosol humidity, if we're on pharmacology, and you go into your Egan's book and the page ain't matching or something like that, go to your index. Or go to your glossary, I mean, your table of contents and say, okay, pharmacology, oh, that's chapter such and such in this book. All right, that's how you have to research and find this stuff now. So you should be looking at chapter 39. It's got a lot of key words in it. It's got a lot of things about um, all the stuff that we've talked about. Now, I'm just saying there might be a few things. Like, look at page 821, the bottom left, 821. Hmm. Read that last paragraph down there, uh, Miss Rose. Page 821 at the bottom left. Yep, tell me what that says right there. There you go. There is a question on the test about the pop-off valve. And I haven't said nothing about that in the lecture because it's just not part of the lecture, but it's in the reading. That's why we tell you, you got to look at the reading and the lecture. Okay, don't just say, oh, he's going to record. I'll look and watch it, eat my little cereal, take my notes, and I'm through, right? That's not going to work. You have to go a step further. So chapter 39 in the new book is aerosol and humidity, all right? So let's look at the syllabus for make sure you understand where um, the next one is. All right, so for aerosol humidity. Now, the other one part will be the airway clearance and all that. So the other chapter says chapter 43 in the old book. So let's see if it's chapter 44 in the new book. Or it might be chapter 43. Because I say it's just the same book, just a different edition. All right, so chapter 43 is lung expansion, okay? Lung expansion therapy. So let's look at chapter 44. 
Oh, chapter 44 is airway clearance therapy. All of that inf information about coughing and uh, bronchiectasis, chest PT, ciliary dyskinetic syndromes, herpes frequencies, huff coughing, incipiation, all that stuff that's possibly on the test is in the chapters. You guys have to read the book. You're paying a whole lot of money for this book. You have to read it. So those are the two chapters. So if you look through those chapters, you say, oh, okay, I see all those stuff he talked about. The PEP device, the acapella. Look on page uh, eight, uh, 965. 965 has a whole picture of those devices I talked about. Here they are right here. And they're, they're going to talk about them in detail all through the chapters. And they give you these little, uh, like box 44-7, gives you some little uh, contraindications and things that you look for. So when you're reading and highlighting and comparing this with your lecture and your notes, that's how you prepare yourself for these exams. The meta nail, the chest vest, all that stuff is in the book, okay? Right there. So if you look at those two pages, I mean, those two chapters, you will be fine. You have to do that on all of this. When you go on to the next level, whatever chapters it says read, and if the chapter don't match what you saw, just go to the very next because it's a new edition. No big deal. It's right there. If you have to, you go to the table of contents and find that information. All right? And so you need to be reading, highlighting. That book should be full of markers, colors, all of that, because that lets me know you're studying. Okay? Now, the next lesson will start pharmacology. That is a book of birth, chapter 35 and 39. Am I sharing my screen? Okay. All right. So the next chapter is pharmacology. And let me look. Look right here. Aerosol humidity said 38 and 43, but it's a new edition, so it's 39 and 44. All right? That's not hard to find. But you need to read. If you're not sure, look in the table of contents for aerosol therapy. It's going to take you right to the chapter. All right. When you're looking for air, airway clearance, it'll take you right to the chapter. So 39 is for aerosol humidity and 44 was for airway clearance. Now let's look for pharmacology, which is coming up next. Pharmacology is RT210I. They're telling you that you need to be in Egan's 35 and 39. So let's look. Let me look at 35, it's probably 36, but let's look at 35 to make sure. Chapter 35. I don't think it's 35, let's look at. Airway phone call, what chapter is that? 36. So go to 36, because it's a new edition. 36 is airway pharmacology. There it is right there. You need to read that because it's got all those drugs and all those dosages and all this different, uh, the, uh, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system that you're going to have to learn. It's a lot. You cannot just look at these lectures, guys. If you've been flying by without looking at the book thus far, it's going to catch up with you, especially on the final. The final, the oral, that kind of stuff, that stuff coming out these books, right? You got to make sure you're reading the book. That's all I was saying. So 36 and probably 40, right? 36 and probably 40 will be the what you need to look for on those, okay? So I'll put enable editing. Pharmacology, 36 and 40, okay? For the one you just did now is 39, 39 and 44, okay? And do the same thing with, uh, Hyperinflation. When we get to hyperinflation, RT210J, hyperinflation, you're gonna, we're going to go through here and make sure that's on the right page. So I'll go through here and look at them too to make sure they're right. 
But if you see chapter 25, it's probably 26, and it's probably not 32, but 33, probably not 42, but 43, and, and so on, okay? This is a new edition. So you find what you need and go to those chapters. You guys have to read this stuff. You have to, okay? So if you haven't been reading, I don't know how you're getting through, but it will catch up with you. All right, so Eros all a minute. I'm going to go back to that chapter, which was 39. Yeah, Aristotle 39. 39. All right. So if we look at chapter 39, go back and look. You see all of the different nebulizers, wonderful pictures of the nebulizers, diagrams of the humidifiers showing you what each one is. Okay. Showing you what the uh the, the schematics of it, how it works, all of that stuff is in the book. Okay. All right. So stuff like uh the hydroscopic. Condenser. Look at page 83. The top of 83, that's called a hydroscopic condenser. What do you think that is? Yeah, page 823. Did I say 83? My bad. Page 823. Talking about aerosol humidity. Page 823, the top of there, what do you think that is? The hydroscopic condenser. What do you think that is? The HME, okay, but it might not use the word HME. They may say the patient is on a hydroscopic condenser. How often should it be changed? You're like, well, I don't know. You can say how long it should be changed, but the book does. It tells you how often it should be changed, when it should be changed, all of that in the book. It talks about the relative humidity. So it may say a, a patient had a hydroscopic or an HME. What does it mean that the HME is, has an 80% relative humidity? What does that mean? Does it mean you're getting 80% of the fluid? Does it mean you're getting 80% of the temperature? Uh, you know, you got to know that. That's not detailed in the out in the, uh, the uh, lecture. That's detailed in the book. Okay? So you have to be in the book to answer these questions. All right? So the reason I said it, I want you in those two chapters when I put this stuff up on for your working, for your classwork, you need to be working on it through the book. So not only the notes, but be in your book so you can find these answers. Don't just wait on me to go over it. You need to find these answers, okay? You need to find these answers. Matter of fact, I'm going to put these questions up and pause the screen. So I'm going to let the ones who are here and live be working on these. I'm going to scoop the screen up. You can work on some more, okay? And then what happens is tomorrow morning, I will go over them before the test. And, I'm, and since everybody will be here, I expect everybody to have it complete because you're going to complete it now, right? And so I should have it complete. And that way you can tell me what you got for that one, right? What you found for that one, right? So you can work on it now with your book open, your notes or whatever to try to find these answers. Because if you just wait on me to tell you, then you're just going to memorize, all right? And the memory fails. Don't forget. So let's share the screen and go to this. Where is it? All right. I'm going to put these up on the screen and you can find these in your book and in your uh, notes. So I'm going to start with. I'm going to put one and two up, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to put them up, but then I'm going to move on. I'm not going to move really fast, but I'm going to give you time to find it, but I'm going to move on so that everybody at home, when you're getting this, you're able to get it and work on it at home as well, okay? This is classwork. So one and two right now, and then I'm just going to move it up, right? If you don't get it done, like I'm still on number two, just go on to the next one. Try to work on them because you can go home tonight and go back to this PowerPoint that I'm doing or this lecture and slow it down so you can answer these questions because i'm not giving the answers i'm just giving the questions today i want you to find them because i got a feeling half of y'all have not been in these books
Make sure when you come to lab that you are dressed out. Hair is natural hue. You got your lab coat, your stethoscope. Uh, you know, everybody's always groomed and clean, but your fingernails, those fingernails cannot be long overlays and all that. You have to cut all that off for lab. Okay, you cannot have, that's not the dress code. Make sure you're, you're ready for that tomorrow during lab. Scoot it up a little bit. All right, guys, that completes that class work. Uh, you need to be working on that. If you were working out, had a few people working on it, if you went ahead and left, like I said, you could leave. Um, but you need to complete that. We will go, that's not submitted for homework. The homework is number four. Uh, that's what's for homework, and it is uh, a couple of pages. So make sure you complete that for homework. The class work I just did is for you to help see that a lot of these type questions may be in the reading more so than the lecture this time. So you have the pages to be reading. You should already have been in your books reading your material. Uh, so tomorrow is lab day and test. You're going to come in. We'll go over this classwork really quickly. And then we're going to go ahead and break off into some groups, practice a little bit about the, um, the humidifier, showing me the different humidifiers, I'll be able to show me the different airway clearance devices and how you position a patient to drain a certain segment. I will go around to each group and tell you where your secretions are found. X-ray shows your secretions in this segment, yours were in that segment. And I will let you uh, position your patient to the proper way, okay? Um, uh, let's see here. After that, we will Put everything back up in the lab and take our exam and we can go home okay uh, i said that i might have if i ran out of time i would do the exam friday but i shouldn't run out of time let me get this out the way and you can have the test done and then friday we can start fresh with pharmacology okay pharmacology is a is a is a is a pretty strong subject it's fun if you learn it uh, but at the same time it's a lot of information okay a lot come from the book, a lot come from the lecture and different tricks that I'm going to teach you about uh, drug doses and calculations and all of that, okay? So make sure you, so we say that for Friday, that way we don't have a test and then go into a new one like that. We can go fresh uh, Friday morning with the exam, okay? So, I mean, I, I'm sorry, strike that. Fresh Friday morning with pharmacology. And tomorrow will be the exam and the lab. See you tomorrow. Have a good night.